Good morning. It's Easter Saturday, uh, it, it, at least morning in Edmonton. It's three o'clock in, in uh, London and in Nigeria. And we're very pleased to have Dr. Anselm Adodo with us. He's a Benedictine monk. Uh, he's a scientist. He's working on incredible new uh, nature-based, uh, well, let's say, medicines or protocols. And uh, particularly relevant, I think, for uh, the coronavirus situation we're in. And um, I'm going to let Anika introduce our friend because it's our mutual friend. And we're so blessed to have you join us from Africa, from Nigeria today. Welcome, Ansal. So good to see you here. And considering that you are such a busy person, everybody is after you nowadays, the governments and everybody. So thank you for taking the time out. Um, so basically Anselm and I work very closely together as well, but that's more about research and education. And Anselm being uh, um, the alternative healer as well as uh, nature power is something that he advocates a lot. And I think it's no coincidence that if we look at the alchemy, that the person who is advocating nature power has also introduced the transformation studies in Nigeria as well, which um, the theory has come from uh, Ronnie Lessam and Alexander Schiffer, but Anselm has um, sort of, you know, he's molded it into the local context. And especially in the, um, in the, um, sorry, the monastery, the laboratory is in the monastery, which is fascinating. So mm -hmm. he's going to tell us about nature power as well as Pax Africana. So over to you and welcome. Thank you, Anika and uh, Mark. Uh, I'm Anselm Adodo. I have been living in a Benedictine religious uh, monastery for a, some 35 years now. Uh, so I came to the monastery as a young man, and I was inspired to go to a monastery as a young boy because of my love for nature. Uh, I needed something different. I grew up with uh, parents who are teachers. My father, a university a teacher. My mother, also a teacher. Uh, we live in kind of a confined environment, but my soul was revolting against the kind of education that uh, I was getting, uh, the conventional kind of education. I wanted to explore further, to explore my soul, because in my school, I learned biology, chemistry, physics, mm. literature, but nobody was teaching me about storytelling. Nobody was teaching me about the, the inner exploration of life. Eventually, when I came to the monastery, I studied philosophy, theology, and uh, so I've been living within the monastery where I've been teaching also. So I spent the last 30 years exploring and teaching the philosophy of nature. And my teaching is basically to remind humanity that we need to come back home because I always feel that we are wandering away too far from nature, both in economics, in politics. Mm. And when I was a child, you know, my grandmother used to tell me all the time that the plants can talk, that the animals can talk, mm. and that the trees <laughs> can talk. And I ask her, what do you mean? How can the animals and plants talk? And she will smile and then she will respond that my son there is more to hearing than what you hear and there is more to speaking than what you say mm. and I always remember that so my work in the past 20 years has been to remind us humanity that when God made men and women he gave us all that is needed to be happy to be whole and to be healthy, water, air, sunshine, which are all free, which we didn't buy, 
And out of greed and selfishness, we began to exploit the earth because we want to sell the free gift mm. and make some money out of it. So we abuse them, destroy them, and treat the earth with disrespect. And the result is crisis, economic crisis, no mental crisis, social crisis, political crisis, climate crisis. Now the world is in crisis. Why? Because it is populated by over 6 billion greedy individuals. That's <laughs> you and I. <laughs> so my, now the world needs to listen. Uh, we need to know that we have lost our childhood innocence. And uh, somehow we know that our happiness, that our owners lies in regaining this sense of owners, which we have lost. And it's very important that we, we go back to that. So that has been my work. And uh, I've been doing that for the past 20 years. Thank you. So I'm going to step in here, especially in the current situation that we are in. Uh, your words are like music to my ears. And I'm really happy that we, you are here and telling the world about this or whoever is listening, to be very honest. Uh, so historically, it all started with alchemy. So alchemists were people who were philosophers as well. Philosophers became physicians, right? So it all started from alchemy to toxicology and now to big pharma, you know, so here we are. Um, what do you say about, I do understand that the plants have to be nurtured and you know they have to be organic. We can't mass produce uh, for, to cover for six billion people. What is the solution in your, um, in your opinion? How do we cater? You know, we do need those medicines and then the, this plant-based medicine. Where do we go from here? Yes, uh, where we need to go is first to change our perspective about life. And uh, we need to learn to retell the story of humanity, where we came from. And uh, we need to know that the primary source of our creativity and intelligence is actually the earth, is nature. Because before we began to, man to manufacture, to invent, nature was already there. Mm. So science, we should always remember, does not or does not create anything. Science mm. only tries to exploit what is already there in nature. And science only tries to play around nature, manipulate it, control it, exploit it, and do all kinds of things with it. So, and our education, our politics is actually based in nature. People go to universities, for example, to become experts, professionals, professors in various fields of human knowledge, philosophy, medicine, physics, chemistry, pharmacy, botany, biology, astronomy, geography. Describe it as you like, call it what you like. It still boils down to one thing nature. So it is very important that when we speak about medicine, about healing, it is about coming back to nature. So we need to cultivate the soil, to till the soil. We need to nurture it. We need to learn how nature survives because we are actually the youngest occupants of the earth. Before we came, the plants and the animals, they were here before us. And we just can't come and take over without learning from all these guys who were here before us. <laughs> so I think we need to go back to nature and learn, and then we can begin to recover our oldness. That is why we practice herbal medicine in Nigeria in a very rational and scientific way. Ansem, you, you remind me of my work with indigenous people who also uh, like your grandmother or like our grandparents. Uh, and even my mother-in-law talks to her plants and we think she's crazy, but she knows something. Um, when we work with indigenous people, when I go into the forest with them, 
the elders, they kneel down to the plant, a little plant that I didn't recognize. I'm a forester. And they give thanks to the plant. They give it tobacco, offer sacred tobacco. And they say, thank you, which means they have a relationship with everything and everything is in relationship with us. Um, and I'm just I'm curious at what you, how we should uh, understand this coronavirus. What is the virus teaching us? And what is nature calling us uh, to rediscover? Um, is nature, you know, the, that just a simple understanding what a virus is and how it affects our dis-ease at the cellular level. And I think what you're doing is offering uh, an ultra, well, a, a medicine, let's say that food and the plants, in fact, are medicines, they wanna heal us. And so can you talk about this virus and then the context of what you're working on uh, with your herbal uh, remedies, medicines that come from the plants and nature? Yeah, thank you, Mark. I think the first lesson that I think we are learning from the virus is simply the reminder that uh, the virus, uh, you can't really kill a virus anyway. <laughs> uh, you can't <laughs> kill a, a bacteria or pathogen, but a virus, you can't even kill it. And uh, it is the, I think the virus, the epidemic is drawing our attention to the fact that we should allow nature to do its work Eventually, the victory will be won by the human immune system. And uh, we simply need to support the body immunity to do its work. And uh, our problem even started because we interfere too much with the yes, immunity. Yes, yes, what is there. yes. So yes. for me, that, that's the first lesson. Mm. And uh, we also need to learn to let go. We always think we know more about nature and want to improve on what is, is there. Mm. In reality, we, God does not need our contribution in that way. <laughs> he needs our contribution in admiring what is there, in yes. beautifying what is there, not to want to take it over. So I think the helplessness that the world feels today is very uncomfortable because we are used to identify the enemy, isolate the enemy and kill it off. Now we have an enemy that we can't even see it. And uh, <laughs> the powerful of the world, they feel so helpless, so uncomfortable because you can't even see the enemy to fight it. So, I just love it. <laughs> yeah. So I think the epidemic is telling us to embrace our powerlessness, that we will all die one day and uh, we need to see ourselves as just a part of nature. We are not even the center of, yes. of nature. And uh, when we do that, I think the solution will come more easily. Huh. Because when we let nature be, when we stop destroying what we have. So for us, we should learn to respect what God has made and uh, beautify it, but not to huh. destroy it. Yeah. So in our medical practice, we try to build our theory of uh, uh, treating the epidemic in this way. How do we boost the human immune system mm. in such a way that nature can do the work? Yes. Uh, not what we want to take over and do. But at the mm. end of the day, medicine does not really cure. It's actually the human body at the end of the day who does yes. the cure. You are we so don't right. Like to hear that. Yeah, we don't yeah. like to hear that. We want to be in control and yes. get a Nobel Prize that we have done this. Now the epidemic is telling us that we need to give to nature you know, the respect that it deserves. Yes, because I see I see your point. It's not about just exploiting the, um, the nature. We have actually expo exploited our own bodies as well. So it's not yeah. like the virus is suddenly here. It was here already, but we never sort of work on our building up our immunity, you know, overeating and you know, having all that junk food, not eating healthily. So that's the effect. I think that's what is actually worsening the situation. So, yeah. Ansem, I, I love your reflection. I, I also been thinking that this is in part the, a, a, a call for improving our own immune system. And we know that 
we've been eating so much terrible food, you know, junk food. Uh, and some scientists are saying we now have the, the symptoms of that are leaky gut, so that our intestinal flora is like a healthy forest ecosystem. And when it's compromised, when it starts to leak, we get toxicity leaks into our blood. And, and so what, what are you doing in terms of helping to with, with your practice and, and, um, and, the, and your business model, I guess, helping to help us strengthen our interior flora and fauna, our, our gut, really, uh, because the gut is almost like a brain, I, my understanding. And so we need to restore its vitality. And of course, the herbs and found in nature are going to be part of that restoration uh, of our inner flora ecosystem. Yeah, sure, Mark. Yes, you know, in the last uh, two weeks, I've received several calls from the medical professionals you know, all over Africa, in Nigeria. These are top guys in medicine, and uh, you know, we've been talking, and they say, "What now? What next?" <laughs> say, but you are the expert. So, what next? They say, well, they don't really know what to do. So, what do you have from nature? And for me, that has been very you know, inspiring. So we are now working with the government across Africa to see how we can develop immune boosting supplements, uh, how we can draw people's attention to the importance of not abusing the body. We need to rest, we need to sleep, we need to care for nature, for the environment, and we also need to care for the soil, the ground under our feet and because eventually, whatever poisons we put into the air comes down to the earth. Uh -huh. So we are at the moment developing some immune boosting supplements. And uh, it is inspiring that now the government, who have been so uh, disinterested for, for so long, suddenly they are so anxious <laughs> and uh, they want to cooperate. So I think that is one good thing that is coming out of this challenge of today. So we are developing immune boosting supplements. We are also doing a lot of orientations for people about the importance of uh, you know, living a good, healthy life. And now, uh, a few days ago, I addressed a, gr a group of people and I told them that now they can understand the importance of the phrase that uh, smokers are liable to die young, which we all have in all the packets of cigarettes. It simply means that uh, smoking probably weakens the immune system in such a way that when you have an, an enemy, a virus coming from the outside, you have already weakened your immune system so much. So that is what we are doing, enlightenment, education, and also making practical products that people can use to counteract the problem. So I have um, two questions uh, relate, in relation to this. Firstly, that um, how do you counter the challenge of people telling you that alternative healing is not, this is not scientifically proven? This is one question. I mean, I hear this from people always when i sort of advocate oh no her herbs are good and they cure and people say this is although a lot of people are not now switching over to the alternative healing uh, method and secondly so what happens when this becomes a business as well because as you started off by saying it's our greed you know it's the big companies that take over and it becomes business rather than healing, which should be offered to people. Um, so how do we counter all this or what do you have in mind, please? Yes, there, are, there will always be different philosophies, different uh, you know, attitudes to medicine. We are never going to have the same agreement on everything. So mm -hmm. there will always be people who don't believe in uh, allopathic medicine just as we always have people who will never believe in uh, alternative therapies. But I think gradually we have more and more people who believe in uh, you know, alternative natural therapies. Uh, and there's quite a large you know, body of knowledge available. 
and even allop allopathic medicine could be developed. So it, many have been developed from herbal medicines. Uh, as you know, quinine, for example, you know, is developed from uh, an, yes. a tree that grows in Africa. Yeah. So I think the discrepancy, the disagreement could be more in the methodology, really, not mm. in the philosophy. I think we all believe that nature heals, nature cures. Mm. I think the methodology could be different mm. uh, because the methodology depends on your own culture and your own philosophy. Mm. Uh, regarding business, there's no problem in um, making business out of your therapy, provided you solve a problem. I think the problem with modern economics is that you create a problem and then you create a business out of uh, the problem and you make profit over it. <laughs> I think that is the challenge we have. But if we identify a problem, and then you provide a solution, you are perfectly right in making profit out of that business because you have provided a solution genuinely that uh, profits humanity. So I think the problem with the economy of today is we look around for a problem. If you don't find any, we create one. And then we also create the solution. And then we make money out of that. And we don't care uh, what happens to other people. I think that is a problem with capitalism, with the kind of uh, economics of today. I so, totally agree with you. So, uh, Ansem, you, you, as an economist, I think you've you've identified the the, the economic virus, uh, the virus <laughs> of money, the love of money, if you like, greed, and um, on a wide worldwide, and the whole world is, you know, it doesn't matter where you are. Uh, we all s seem to get addicted to materialism, uh, to greed, which I think in part is our fear of tomorrow. Uh, it's grounded in our fear of death, perhaps, uh, mortality. Um, but what you're saying is nature is our teacher. It teaches us resilience. Um, it's like we've, we're still in the Garden of Eden. I don't think we've ever in a way left it. We've just, our eyes are being closed and we're under a spell maybe. Uh, spell of other stories you forget yeah and and one of the things we've been talking about is and i love the painting behind you is uh i've, I've mentioned several times a book i've just read called a story waiting to pierce you a story about pythagoras and how he was he had an ecstasy which means out of your to be out of your mind because he encountered a mongolian mystic who came from mongolia an indigenous mystic mm -hmm. who gave him mathematics who gave him imparted his understanding of the universe um, mm. and so it feels like we're in this beautiful pause waiting for a new story and you talked about narrative the importance of story and even things your grandmother had taught you about plants having language um, what what would you say is from your perspective from a, a Nigerian African perspective which we think is still maybe has a remnant of that understanding of that beautiful purity of, of relationship with nature. What, what what do you feel is the new narrative, new story that is just waiting for us or waiting for us to receive? Yes, uh, I, I think uh, today we need to revisit our model of education very seriously in the modern world because I think the kind of education that we received in the world uh, gave us the impression that we can solve our problems just by you know, learning uh, through technology, uh, where they meet that enough knowledge and technology in terms of computers, machines, satellites, in, uh, internet, that once you master that, they will can control and rule the world. But now we are discovering that the complexity of the earth is simply too complex. The functioning of the atoms, the protons, <laughs> the bacteria, pathogens, viruses, they are too complex for us to even comprehend. Mm. So for me, what needs to be managed and solved today is not the earth, but human desires, human economics, human politics, and mm -hmm. communities. So mm -hmm. for me, uh, the earth is not sick, 
the planet is not sick. We are, it is humanity that is sick. So we need help. <laughs> and so I hear people a lot say that we should, we should cure the earth, that the earth is sick. No. Then who is the doctor then? I think we need help. And, uh, we need the head... heart physicians. Physicians <laughs> we <need> of <laughs> the heart. Physicians <laughs> of the heart who can cure yes. our hearts. Beautiful. So beautiful. Yes. I'm so yes. happy to hear this from you. And Ansem, I, I, I have to ask you this question because you're a Benedictine. Um, you know, St. Benedict lived in what, five some 500 something. Um, interesting time, I'm sure. But uh, can you remind us of your core, the rule of St. Benedict? And I think it's really fitting for our reflection today. Yeah, thank you, Mark. Yes, the rule of St. Benedict, you know, the very first word in the rule of St. Benedict is listing. And uh, for me, that has a big meaning, even now, listing. So I, I think we need to listen. Uh, we are being able to manufacture so much gadgets to get us talking, but we have not been able to make gadgets that can help us to listen. So, so I think the rule of St. Benedict is so important. Uh, and uh, keep in mind that the Benedictines, they are the they form the background of Western civilization. So inventions in agriculture, even in medicine, actually has its foundation in the monasteries in the Western Europe. So I think for me as a Benedictine, I could see the rule of St. Benedict uh, needing to be read all over again, that we need to listen. I think that is what we need today. Uh, leaders, political leaders, they need to listen. Uh, we need to listen to ourselves, to nature, to the environment, to our body. So the Benedictines, they have a big role to play, to remind the world of today that we need to listen. We have done enough of talking. We have so much gadgets to keep us talking. But can we invent a machine that can help us to listen more to one another? <laughs> that is my I question for the world of today. Beautiful, beautiful. I think, I think you, you and I have uh, have had a dialogue about this, you know, yes. too much talking and, you know, yeah. words should stop now. Um, and yeah. sorry, This Mark. is a per perfect reflection because my wife says, all you do is talk and talk and talk. <laughs> That's for you as well, Mark, just listen. <laughs> Okay, so thank you so much, uh, Ansel. But you, before Ansel. you go, before you go away, just quickly, I think the world needs to know about Pax Africana as well. And what you were telling me about that, they can come to the laboratory and learn about herbal medicine. And you know, in fact, I was so touched. You were saying you don't even charge them for training. So maybe just quickly tell everybody about Pax Africana, what you do there. Thank you. Yes, uh, Pak Saba, which is located in the monastery in Nigeria, in Western Nigeria, uh, is the, we have one of the largest alternative medicine manufacturing company uh, here in Nigeria with more than 100 full-time staff. And we have uh, pharmacists, microbiologists, biochemists, pharmacists, all working together under the same roof here. And uh, we have extended our practices to all over West Africa. I think we produce hundreds of thousands of herbal supplements. Uh, and we work also with the government. So we now set up the Past Africana to be the intellectual foundation for all this. Because these are stories that need to be documented. Mm -hmm. So we are now trying to teach universities to let them see the importance of connecting knowledge with communities, with industry, and with literature. So that is what Pax Africana is about, building on the experience of Pax Saba over the past 25 years to document what we have done and to see what uh, the world can learn from this. So I spend a lot of my time now writing, trying to write the story because I think the story is very important for the world of today. God bless you and have a blessed Easter Sunday. Thank, Thank you so you. much. Thank you, Ansel. Thank, Thank you. you so much. All right.
Bye now. Bye.